Tal Becker is a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's a former senior policy advisor to Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a lead negotiator for decades of Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. And I'm lucky enough to get to study with him each summer at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. This July, he suggested it is time to put the Jewish people on the couch. It's time to have a look at the psychology of the Jewish people today. What does he see? He uses a basic understanding of schema therapy. So apologies to the psychiatrists among us. This is my basic understanding of schema therapy. That every one of us has a life trap, a childhood wound that we revisit every time we are faced with a challenge in life. So what is the life trap of the Jewish people? What wound must we tend again and again when challenges come our way, as God help us, they often do? We find we have to go all the way back to the beginning. The first two chapters of Torah give us conflicting messages and create a life trap. Genesis 1 says, Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo, b'tzalem Elohim bara oto. And God created Adam in God's image. In the image of God, God created that first human being. God created a mini-me. Vayivarech otam, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over everything that creeps on earth. Be powerful, God says. Be like me. I'm powerful, you can be powerful. I rule so you can rule. I create so you can create. I give you that charge. I give you that empowerment. And behold, I've given you every seed-bearing grass which is upon the face of the earth and every seed-bearing fruit tree. It shall be as fruit for you. God says, I'm gonna give you everything. It's all for you. It's all yours. Freely. And you will be my darlings. You will be my beloveds, God says. And then comes Genesis 2. There it is written, and God said to Adam, because you ate of that tree, the only one of which I commanded you, do not eat of it. The ground shall be cursed for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your bread until you return to the earth from out, of which you, from out of which you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. So now in Genesis 2 we find that we are cut off and kicked out of the garden. We are unforgivable failures. Genesis 1 promises that we are a little less than divine, touched by God, infused with a measure of God's power, thrillingly capable, and given a beautiful home to live in, no less. Genesis 2 asserts that we are mortal, made from lowly dust, powerless, landless wanderers. So this is our life trap, Tal Becker says. We're caught between believing that the world is our playground and ours to master, and that we are but dust and ashes, homeless. The High Holidays, I believe, reinfer reinforce this life trap, this dual message. On Rosh Hashanah, the universe is created anew for us. It is ours to inherit, it is ours to steward, and we are created new again. On Yom Kippur, however, we are a puddle of failure and disappointments. We are utterly dependent upon God's mercy and God's capacity for forgiveness. 
So which is it? Of course, it depends on the day, and it depends on the challenge that comes our way. Some days we rise to the occasion with ingenuity and emotional intelligence, and some days we are pinned under it, and the waves of anxiety wash over us. When Tal Becker puts contemporary Jewry on the couch today, the trauma which dominates the conversation both for Israeli and for North American Jews is the Shoah. Now two and three and even four generations later, we are still psychologically shaped by the Holocaust. Whether or not we are direct descendants of those who perished descendants of those who survived, whether or not we have those personal family stories, the Holocaust is nevertheless encoded on our DNA, every one of us. It is a shared experience, and it motivates us in different ways, sometimes in strange ways, and so we should be made more aware of it. Israeli Jews respond to the Shoah by growing to be as powerful as they can, politically, geographically, economically, militarily, by the skin of their teeth, by their sheer brilliance, and by their great courage, they have succeeded in becoming powerful. Israel is both the startup nation and the victim nation. The psychology of the Shoah still weighs heavily North American Jews, by contrast, respond to the life trap of the Shoah by focusing on the morality of the powerless. We turn to our Judaism to prompt acts of social justice, to defend the underdog. Later this week, Jaius, the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society, will set up its centennial celebration exhibit here at Holy Blossom Temple because our congregation has been Jaius's partner for 100 years, sponsoring fa- countless newcomers to Canada, both Jews and non-Jews. And so Jaius has asked that the exhibit be here, and it is our honor to host them. I hope you will come to enjoy it. Think back to when Holy Blossom Temple welcomed Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King to address from this bima, And we raised thousands of dollars to support the American Civil Rights Movement. And think back to our Out of the Cold program, which now needs to be reborn and reconceived. How we welcomed vulnerable neighbors in for shelter. And remember how we established the AIDS Committee to provide support networks for those who were sick and otherwise marginalized. Tal Becker would say, if we are willing to lie on the couch, we would find that these acts of justice and righteousness in support of the powerless are in fact a very healthy response to the trauma of when we were utterly powerless. Perhaps not many of us personally by now, but some. And again, we are all of us inheritors of that collective trauma. But here's our problem. For many generations, the State of Israel was the national therapeutic process to heal from the Jewish people's life trap of power and powerlessness, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The Zionist idea was intended to solve that problem, to square that circle. We were to unify world Jewry around the Zionist idea, the Zionist project. It was an invitation to embrace the mission of Genesis 1 without any reservation. We would prove ourselves to be human beings with power. Sadly, however, there is a growing gap between Israeli Jews and North American Jews. It's a consequence of two clashing responses to the trauma of the Shoah. Even here in Toronto, and certainly south of the border, there are a growing number of younger generation, uh, very capable and bright people who can't understand why Israel has to flex its muscles as often as it does. 
And at the very same time, there is a growing number of Israelis who can't understand why North American Jews are constantly shrying gewalt over human rights. It's true that Israel does not glorify powerlessness. Israelis do not see powerlessness as a virtue. But there is a growing recognition among a growing number of the younger generation in Israel that the source of Israel's strength can eventually become its weakness. And so we need to take care. We are one people coping with a shared trauma in two opposing and clashing ways. And God help us, we are becoming more and more of a mystery to one another. Israeli Jewry and North American Jewry. Al chetanu lefanecha, for the sin we have committed against you by drifting apart from our Israeli brothers and sisters and siblings. On Rosh Hashanah, I spoke with you about the difference between hoping and dreaming. I, suggest that each, I suggested that each of us has been hoping for a long time now and that it's time to take up dreaming again. Hoping is a tactic, a healthy coping mechanism of wistfully and wishfully waiting for something to shift, for something to ease, for something to give way. Dreaming, however, is a more active stance, not a fantasy to be sure, but an in-reach vision of a finer and nobler version of ourselves and our world. And what is true for us as individuals, more often than not, is also true for the collective. So how can the Jewish people turn from hoping to dreaming? How do we get up off that couch? The state of Israel will turn 75 years old this spring. I hope you'll join me and fellow congregants on the UJA mission to celebrate. When Israel turned 70, Holy Blossom Temple had the largest contingent on the UJA mission. I'm proud to say we were the Lamed Vavnikim, the 36 travelers together, and we had a wonderful time. I want to assure you that there are many tracks in this trip. So if you are a, new uh, a first time traveler, there is something there for you. If you're looking for advanced seminars, high-tech innovation, cutting-edge scientific research, geopolitics, and so on, or even if you're looking for hiking and biking and helicoptering and adventuring of all kinds, there is something for you to enjoy. And I'm also proud to say that our Holy Blossom Temple teen trip to Israel will be back this spring, March break. Details for both of these trips can be found on our website. 75 years, remarkable, astounding, miraculous, a true miracle in our lifetime. Israel has surpassed our wildest dreams and the wildest dreams of its founding mothers and fathers. So what now? Have our dreams for the Jewish state come true and now we just watch her grow into maturity and maintain a relatively secure and successful environment. Yehuda Kurtzer of the Hartman Institute says that it is both a blessing and a curse to live long enough to see your dreams fulfilled. In retrospect, maybe our dream just wasn't big enough. I have given a high holiday sermon in the past on the theme of loyalty, and I meant it. Looking back at it now, with the insight of Yehuda Kurtzer, I see that loyalty is, of course, essential, but it is not enough. We need the language of dreaming, too. Kurtzer critiques the North American leadership of the last 25 years for replacing the call for imagination with the call for loyalty, replacing the call for creativity with the call for preservation and protection. These were necessary, of course, but somehow the dreaming phase has come to conclusion for diaspora Jewry, 
and we're still holding on to a dream that has already been fulfilled. We implemented and surpassed the dreams of our grandparents and great-grandparents. So what now? It's time for a new dream. Thank God the Zionist dream of 120 years ago has been fulfilled. And so we must honor those who worked and sacrificed to make it so. We must honor those in Israel and throughout the diaspora who were committed and courageous. We could do that now exactly now, by dreaming again. Too many Israelis, right, left, and center, have become satisfied with the status quo. For Israel, let there be a dream of greater justice and greater social transformation and greater shared society. For Israel, let it be a dream of minority rights and religious pluralism. Let the lofty ideals articulated in Israel's own Declaration of Independence be realized in our own time. And for us, global Jewry must get serious about dreaming up serious communities that are seriously committed to vibrancy, to learning, to raising proud children and practicing adults. This falls to all congregations, small, medium, and large, in cities, small, medium, and large. But I believe we have a unique responsibility right here at Holy Blossom Temple in the extraordinary city of Toronto. As Toronto's first synagogue, leading and setting the pace and raising the bar has always been our role to play. So we have a strategic plan ready to roll out this fall with a special emphasis on young families and empty nesters. And we are rolling out the covenant of belonging, a covenant which lowers the bar for joining and raises the bar for meaningful engagement. This spring, we will launch ambitious plans for our schools because there are too many Jewish children in the city of Toronto who are going without a Jewish education, and we cannot stand by and watch. There have always been two anchors in Jewish life. There is the Jewish home, and there is the synagogue. And the Jewish home is not as strong as it once was, so the synagogue has an additional responsibility to support the home and to provide resources so parents can raise their children in the ways of Jewish life. God forbid we should become a generation content with the status quo. God forbid we stop dreaming simply because our dreams came true. Look at us. Look at this magnificent sanctuary. Seeing our dreams fulfilled should only encourage us to believe that anything is possible and the next project must be pursued. If we can make the desert bloom, if we can turn some of our enemies into strategic partners, if we can give life-saving gifts to the world, if we can gather in numbers like this in the midst of a pandemic, then we can do the next hard and wonderful thing too. The national anthem of the State of Israel is Hatikva the hope. But it might have been otherwise. A number of Zionist songs were put forward for consideration. The oldest of those songs of Zion was put forward by the religious Zionists, Psalm 126, and here I will conclude. The first verse of Psalm 126 depicts us not as hopers but as dreamers. Beshuv Adonai et Shivat Zion Hayinu Kecholmim. When God returned us to Zion, we were like dreamers. Let this be the anthem of the coming generations of the Jewish people wherever we make ourselves at home. Shir Hama'alot, a song of ascents. When God returned us to Zion, we were like dreamers, with our mouths filled with laughter and with cheers on our tongues. The other nations looked on and said, 
Adonai has done great things for them. Yes, indeed, Adonai has done great things for us, and we are very glad. Return us again to freedom, Adonai, like streams long dry to the Negev returning. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. The farmer may weep when he buries that precious seed, but singing, he comes back again with his arms filled with grain. Kein Yehiratzon, may it be for us, may it be for Israel, and may it be for the Jewish people throughout the world.